Mexico is a federal state using a presidential system, and just from a geographic standpoint, it is worth noting that Mexico tends to get progressively poorer as you move to, toward the southern end. And so uh, when we talk about the poorest regions of Mexico and some of that have been the most uh, uh, vulnerable to unrest and uh, uh, where the, so that regional class cleavage is uh, very, very evident, it is going to be in southern states such as Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. Um, so uh, maquiladora zones in the north of Mexico where you have those American factories or multinational factories set up, I should say. Um, we begin with the independence movement from Spain. Remember that Spain did colonize Mexico in a very long colonial period, and it was a period in which the Spanish left a number of legacies or would leave a number of legacies, Spanish language and Roman Catholicism being the obvious ones, but also a lack of democratization, a lack of industrialization. Um, and so forth. The independence movement gained traction and uh, exploded in 1810 with Padre Hidalgo and the Grito de Dolores, and uh, that's where the independence movement um, uh, gets solidified in Mexican history. They It was a conservative independence movement, and they were moving away from the liberalizing Spanish and then uh, after 1821, Mexico entered into that Caudillo era. Remember, Caudillo is an authoritarian strongman ruler, and the Caudillo era saw Mexico uh, fall into an era of instability for three main reasons. They had a very unstable um, half a century because of the severe economic decline due to Spanish pilfering of their resources and Spain's mercantilist outlook. Uh, number two, foreign intervention, uh, especially when you talk about the United States coming in and taking a very, very big chunk of Mexico's land, French intervention as well. And then you also have the liberal conservative split, the liberal anti-clericals who sought to reduce the power of the Catholic Church, and your clerical conservatives who sought to maintain the church's power uh, governmentally, educationally, societally. Um, and in other areas. The main caudillo we want you to know from this era is Benito Juarez, the gentleman right here. Remember that Benito Juarez was uh, indigenous. He was a liberal caudillo, wanted to reduce the power of the church. He is seen as a symbol of Mexican sovereignty, someone who stood up for Mexican interests, even in the face of some very difficult foreign intervention. After 1876, Mexico entered into the Porfiriato, in which Porfirio Diaz took over and would rule for 34 years. The Porfiriato was marked by uh, tendencies such as authoritarianism. It was stable, which Mexico needed after uh, such a tumultuous Caudillo period. Um, lots of corruption during the Porfiriato, uh, some forced modernization, uh, improvements in infrastructure, uh, inviting in foreign investment and so forth but lots of authoritarian corruption, which would lead to his end finally in 1910 and the onset of the Mexican Revolution, um, land reform, the gaining the more rights for the, for the, the common people and the peasantry, and um, goals that would be thematic, I think, throughout the 20th century of Mexican history shown in the revolution here. And you have Pancho Villa, Francisco Pancho Villa, and Emiliano Zapata. Those are the two peasant revolutionary heroes. And remember the Zapata is the uh, gentleman whose name the Zapatista Liberation Army took on when they uh, rose up in Chiapas State in 1994. The 1917 Constitution came about, and it was a unique document in several ways. It was an, an example, rather, of social constitutionalism in which the goals of the revolution are embedded in the Constitution, and those were things such as anti-clericalism, reduce the power of the Catholic Church even further. So, whoops, you uh, saw um, reductions in what the church could do publicly, more reductions in the church's land holding, and what they were able to do from a governmental um, influential standpoint. Subsoil rights to the Mexican state was another big one. That subsoil rights to the Mexican state was, in a lot of cases, central to Mexico's goal to limit exploitation of their resources by foreigners. And um, so in it, that one endures to, the, to this day. So um, subsoil rights of resources go to the Mexican state, not individuals. Land reform was another one. We talked about the Ejido system in class where big land holdings were broken up into smaller tracts of land 
for uh, people who needed to have land, and many people got land for their first time through that. It also set up the structure for democratic governance, or governmentance, as this apparently says, unfortunately. Um, and it was gonna be a presidential system, bicameral legislature, and a judicial system with the uh, power of judicial review, which we will get to later. The 1920s saw a bit more instability until the party that uh, became the pre-established dominance. Uh, it was Plutarco Calles, who was the uh, leader of the party uh, when it was still the PNR, that would become the pre, the uh, founder, really, of that party, first major leader. And then Lazaro Cardenas would become the big guy in the 30s who kind of solidified things. But this was the, the 1920s and 30s were the decade, and really 1929 is when the Revolutionary Institutional Party um, became such a big deal. The PRI began its dominance, its period of hegemony. They would not lose control of the presidency for 71 years. And as the PRI became such a hegemonic party, it became just part of the fabric of Mexico, and it was never a one-party state. This was a party of power. This was a dominant party system. Other par uh, parties were allowed to compete. They did not win, of course, and the, the PRI typically uh, or very much saw itself as the revolution's heir. They named themselves the party of the revolution. They took on the colors of the Mexican flag, and they would dominate Mexico in, in, uh, in all aspects for the duration of the 20th century. Lazaro Cardenas was the most beloved of the 20th century Mexican presidents. He was the guy who most resolutely embedded the goals of the revolution. He, he uh, did very much socialist, very much reducing the power of the church again, accelerated land reform through the use of the ejido system. He nationalized oil in 1938 with the creation of Pemex. He also oversaw the creation of the unions that would become the basis for Mexico's corporatist system. And all of those left-leaning tendencies during Cardenas's um, Sesenio, one six-year term, the Sesenio, uh, saw the creation of the National Action Party, the PAN as you had conservative Mexicans and pro-Catholic church Mexicans create uh, an opposition conservative party. After Cardenas, we saw an alteration of Mexican economic philosophies, um, sometimes known as the pendulum theory operating within the PRI as they went back and forth from an economic perspective. But then I, oh, lest I forget uh, to mention Movember again and give you another chance to recognize the beauty of said statement with the presidential uh, mustaches. So just one more look at that. And um, again, I'm just really, really uh, hoping that you appreciate high-level humor such as that as, uh, as you go forward in life, even if you did miss out on, on day one of Mexico. The corporatist system that Cardenas set up was a uh, the system in which there's a reciprocal agreement between certain groups in the state. In this case, it was going to be interest groups, labor unions, um, uh, other business unions and such. And it was in that representation system in which certain groups get privilege to uh, policy-making decisions in exchange for their loyalty. And groups, uh, the, the labor union, the CTM, was the most well-known, the biggest. Um, and remember, corporatism oversees the, the formation of big, powerful interest groups, but it limits genuine uh, representation because they are tied to the state. And so corporatism uh, may be able to make the, the opposition to pluralism Pluralism where uh, groups are independent of the state and multiple groups can fairly compete for power, whereas corporatism, you see um, only certain groups recognized by the state. The Mexican miracle took off in the 1940s when you had the Mexican state utilize ISI, import substitution industrialization, as an economic strategy. ISI would be predicated upon two principles. Number one, the raising of tariffs to keep out foreign goods. And number two, the creation of uh, many, many peristatals to stimulate domestic industry. So ISI, again, was supposed to offset Spanish 
Um, the Spanish non-industrialization of Mexico was supposed to modernize Mexico, allowed them to produce their own domestically uh, produced goods that they formerly had to import. It worked very, very strongly for the better part of two and a half decades. The economy went up, people's literacy rose, there were educational improvements, a green revolution in agriculture, an overall generational improvement in people's lives as Mexico had a major, major period of success, performance, legitimacy for the pre, and the Mexican miracle was one that was one that the Mexicans would showcase or uh, they were going to showcase in the 1968 Olympic Games. Remember that part of the modernization theory posits the idea that not only does the middle class grow, but that middle class starts to demand more political rights as well. And that was going to be something that would challenge the pre as they had a little more repression, citizens demanding more, there came to be student demonstrations on the eve of the Olympic Games at Tlatz local plaza in 1968, and that is where the massacre took place of several hundred students on the uh, eve of the Games, and uh, a major indicator of civil society in Mexico and the government's um, refusal to allow for it. Mexico got into bad debt in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s, because they had overspent, um, overborrowed on the idea that they could always pay it back with oil proceeds and profits. And when oil crisis, uh, prices crashed rather in the early 1980s, Mexico was unable to uh, pay its loans. So Mexico had to go to the International Monetary Fund to supply or to receive a loan and the IMF would provide a loan with conditionalities as part of the broader structural adjustment plan. And the IMF required three things for Mexico in the 1980s, that they had to lower their tariffs to promote free trade, they had to impose austerity measures um, to reduce spending drastically, and they had to privatize much of their industry. And so this is economic liberalization. That's the decade in which you saw economic liberalization in Mexico, and it is the era in which you saw another splinter party, this one to the left, uh, the PRD, Socialist PRD, um, took off because they saw the PRI as betraying the goals of the revolution. The technocrats in Mexico gained more influence during this decade, and as Mexico was shifting economically, we also started to see cracks in the PRI and other areas. We talked about the 1985 earthquake in class with pre-corruption and buildings collapsing because they hadn't been built properly. Corners had been cut, uh, bribes had been taken, money had been pocketed, and you had civil society come up uh, against pre-corruption in that case to prevent the demolishing of rubble with uh, survivors inside to demand answers from the pre. So please link the 85 earthquake with civil society. And the 1988 election followed shortly thereafter. 88 election was the pre versus the PRD with Lazaro Cardenas' son as the standard bearer. And uh, the pre very much cheated to win this one, especially much when the pre uh, pulled the plug out of the computer or from the wall rather as the uh, vote was showing that the PRD was ahead. And remember that when the, uh, the computers got up and running later on, the pre and Carlos Salinas had secured a close victory. But again, our linkage to democratization there will be that the Mexican people demanded electoral reform, and they would get that um, as a result of uh, the creation of the IFE in the 1990s. In 1988, you had, or excuse me, in 1994, um, you had a presidential election and you had the um, assassination of the pre-candidate who was then replaced by Ernesto Zedillo, who won a fair election in 1994. Zedillo had a rough go of it, and uh, right off the bat, he had to deal with stuff happened previously in 94. The Zapatista Liberation Movement had marched out of the uh, woods in Chiapas State, and they had risen up in rebellion against um, things like economic inequality, lack of land availability for the indigenous, lack of educational rights and linguistic rights, and so forth. So that was an armed rebellion against the Mexican state that had to be put down. The same day the Zapatistas rose up, NAFTA was implemented, and that was January 1st of 94, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the uh, agreement multilateral between the United States, Canada, and Mexico that set up a much freer trade system between the three cutting tariffs, opening Mexico to uh, big American goods, and so on. So that was going to be an agreement that would very much benefit the North and hurt the South. 
Um, Zadio had to impose austerity measures because the economy crashed again, so that didn't go over well. Um, he allowed for more independent courts throughout the 90s, which again would weaken pre-power. He over he allowed, if you will, the pre to lose its legislative majority in 97. That was a landmark thing because now the other parties could block the pre in the legislature. The IFE was established, so we started to get freer and fairer elections in Mexico. And on the whole, um, Zadio just oversaw the weakening of the pre. He let it happen. He allowed for more democracy in Mexico and in 2000 he would be the guy who um, said enough of the dedazo that um, the tapping of the successor he allowed for a primary election and that would pave the way for um, Francisco La Bastida to become the nominee in 2000 and in 2000 we would see the landmark um, election in which the National Action Party would claim the presidency for the first time.